This is brought to you by the Centre for Governance, Leadership and Global Responsibility from Leeds Beckett University. And this series of videos uh, is all about the nature of leadership. Uh, the whole point of having several different videos is to try and find what the different approaches are to leadership, to actually begin to develop some kind of dialogue uh, and so begin to learn from each of the different sectors and each of the different styles. You'll see how leadership uh, can be worked out in practice because we'll both be having academics but also key practitioners in their areas. So we're here today with special guest uh, Stuart Watson from uh, EY. Welcome to our Video, video series today. Yeah, thank you very much. So it's really good to have you here. The first thing we wanted to do is basically to tell our audience uh, who you are, uh, who you work for, and uh, how leadership plays within your organization. Okay, so I'm Stuart Watson, as you've already said. I'm senior partner for EY here in Yorkshire. So that covers um, two offices. We have an office in Leeds, an office in Hull give or take 450 people across all of our services. So um, essentially accountancy-based services, tax-based advisory, which means consultancy, some corporate finance, those kinds of things. Um, so reasonable sized team. And we're of course part of a worldwide organization as well. And that's a very interesting uh, fact. We were just talking a uh, moment ago that um, culturally it could be very challenging to oversee uh, such a wide organization with people from all, all walks of life and backgrounds and different um, world view and how, how does leadership play within your organization? How is it structured? Um, so we have an overall worldwide leader and um, um, a council drawn from around the world who work with that leader to set um, the tone, set the strategy set the way that we work and the way we think about dealing with the world and then that cascades down into a national footprint and then as far as I'm concerned down into my part of the UK. Okay, do, do you guys meet together? Do you have like um, um, communication goes and flowing and from this um, leadership? There's comms flowing, there's a mixture of um, scorecards which is sort of fairly detailed what we're trying to achieve in the next short period. Mm -hmm. Um, and then probably from a leadership point of view, much more important, there are, we don't call it a mission statement, but to avoid internal jargon, essentially mission type statement, stuff about values, stuff mm -hmm. about the way uh, we expect ourselves to behave and respond to how the world is working and how business is working. Okay, that's um, very interesting. And in your view, uh, what is leadership? Um, leadership for me, um, I think is setting um, the tone, setting uh, the mission statement, the values, determining how we, whoever we are, want to be in the world and how we want to be seen in the world. And that's for several reasons. That's to do with the kind of business you want to mm -hmm. attract. It's to do with the kind of people that you want to attract into your team. And then once they're in your team, it sets um, uh, parameters that allow you to determine things like how they will behave and so forth. Different, I think, to management, which is about, I don't know, the detail of strategy and implementation of that strategy. So you could put it as taking an uncertain world where things are moving around all the time, and frankly, any plan that you set doesn't really survive contact with reality. So you take that uncertain world, and as a leader, what you're doing is creating certainties in that uncertain world against which managers can then respond and react and get the best out of their team. Well, that's um, very good. And uh, you saved me from my next question would have been that difference between management and leadership. Um, but how do you measure leadership, the success in leadership? What is successful leadership in your view? What do you know is being successful? Um, I guess it's, it sort of it come, probably comes in phases and what can be successful, say over a shortish period of a few years, may or may not because the world is changing all the time mm -hmm. and bearing in mind I just said you're creating essentially a simplified version of the world so that managers in your organization mm -hmm. essentially got something to get their teeth into what they they're asked to do is respond to your vision as the leader of what the world is up to so the world is moving therefore a great leader um, can be great in the in, you know the, in the next five years but then the world has moved on and unless that leader, unless he or she sees it move on, moves the world on, and indeed 
has the confidence of the people around them that they understand how the world is moving on, um, yeah. then they will fail. So they're great if they understand that and respond well to it. Um, tragically, there are plenty who can't and don't respond well to that. And therefore, they have yeah. a moment in time when they are great leaders, subsequently lose the, that will lose the troops, basically. And if you lose the troops, if they've lost their confidence in your vision of the world, um, then you're not the great leader anymore. And, and um, uh, even thinking on, on this last, um, your last statement now, uh, we've seen a lot of crisis in leadership and yep. management, in, um, in finance also, finance sector, there's been quite a lot of uh, breach of trust and people losing trust. And um, in this day and age, and looking in all the changes that we got, security and the threats and, uh, and uh, scandals and, and so forth, can people still trust leadership? And how do you build that trust? These are really big questions. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, right, so over the first hour of my answer, no. <laughs> um, essentially, trust in the leader Mm. And the, the, the idea that the leader does understand what will or will not be effective faced with whatever's going on in the world, whether that's the world of business or I think you were implying there the world of politics and some of the nasty mm -hmm. stuff that's going on in the world. Let's stick to the world of business, which mm -hmm. frankly I know yeah. better than the yeah. political world. So there you might take a view, um, very popular in the 70s and 80s, that corporate life was absolutely all about stakeholders call shareholders. And as long as you absolutely maximize the return to those shareholders, difficult enough thing to do, then you'd be regarded as immensely successful. Mm -hmm. So the world moves on and gets more complicated. And that view as I've just given you perhaps goes to the absolute extreme as it gets refined and refined and refined. And you can end up a place when the pure profit motive sell absolutely as much as you can and never mind the consequences, mm -hmm. takes you to some nasty places. And I think some of the crises we've seen, um, say, uh, where shall I go back to, say in the Enron scandal, um, say in some of the mis-selling scandals around insurance that um, I think most of the banks have had their moments with that. Mm -hmm. A lot of that was driven essentially by what initially would have been perfectly sensible leadership strategies but ended up because they went extreme because they got ultra refined, essentially mm -hmm. not fitting the world that we live in. Mm. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, um, um, we know that, as we say, people are demanding much more transparency now, ethics. They want to know what goes on inside of the boardroom yep. and clients and, um, and the society, you know, the wider uh, stakeholders. Um, uh, the thing is that how do you build that model of leadership to engage the wider stakeholder? How, how can you connect with, the, the, with this? Oh, part of what we do is global responsibility. That, that's part of the center and part, part of our yep. work here is understanding the, the wider discussion, the, the, to promote this discussion about ethics and transparency. And, uh, and on the other side, you have uh, the shareholders, you have the interests of the company. How do you, how the leader can, can actually build that uh, integrated sort of uh, scenario and understanding within the organization outside to the state stakeholders to actually uh, put the message across. How, how do you think that is the, the, the leader's role in this uh, area? Well, again, so great big questions. Um, um, and I'm not going to pretend to be an expert mm -hmm. essentially in how to do this on a global scale. Mm -hmm. um, I think a leader needs um, to set out a vision needs to be good. He or she needs to be good at communicating that. So if you've got a big team, if there are many thousands of people who are spread out, particularly if they're spread out in several cultures, the ability to communicate messages about how we as an organization are going to behave, how we're going to respond to the market, how we see ourselves and our place in business and the impact that we have then on the wider community. If you can put those messages across and put them across in a way that people a, understand, and then B, believe in. So they trust the message coming from leaders. It has integrity. It's backed up by the actions as well as just words. Any fool can come up with some nice mm. words that says we should you know, go and do good things. Backed up with actions. Then you have credibility. You have the trust of your people inside. If they then, add, especially if it's thousands of people, if they then behave in the way that you're describing to them and the outside world, well, then you're starting to build trust. These things take years. In contrast, 
loss of trust mm -hmm. or loss of integrity of the leader as a sort of internal issue or loss of trust of the organisation as an external issue. Um, that probably takes all about half an hour to lose. Um, earlier on, we were talking about some of your, your roles within the organisation, yeah. but particularly one that really uh, drew my attention is that recognising young leaders and young entrepreneurs. Can you, can you talk a little bit about... You mean the, our Entrepreneur of the Year Yes, awards. exactly. Okay. Because that's one way the organisation also recognises young, in innovative leaders that are coming up. Well, we actually recognise entrepreneurs doing dynamic and interesting things of any age. Mm -hmm. So there isn't, some, there isn't a sort of under 30 or 40 or whatever. Okay. This is entrepreneurs of any age. And what that uh, awards programme is doing is around the world, so 60 countries around the world we do this, mm -hmm. um, is looking for outstanding examples of entrepreneurs. And partly what we're doing there is, is wanting to promote what dynamic entrepreneurs can do for an economy. Mm -hmm. Essentially, if you have an economy that doesn't have great entrepreneurs trying to do new things, and some succeeding, and by the way, some failing as well. But if that isn't going on, you're not revitalizing your economy. Mm -hmm. So we think, and I guess what I particularly think, given I lead the program, that great entrepreneurs doing these innovative things, trying to do things in a different way, are absolutely in the lifeblood of an economy that's going to be a sensibly placed economy. Mm -hmm. So around the world, we're celebrating these great folks. So I'll concentrate on the UK bit. So in the UK, um, uh, in this coming spring, so every year we kick off basically the 1st of January every year and we go out and look for dynamic entrepreneurs. We're particularly interested in those doing it differently, those having you know, signs of great innovation. That could be um, in the world of technology, which I know you're particularly interested in, doing things which require you know, the brain size of a planet and really clever tech stuff. It could be taking the oldest industry in the world and doing it faster, smarter, better than the next guy. Mm. So it could be that your processes or your ways of marketing or your ways of doing whatever your older industry is, is just particularly clever. And or it could be, you know, the big brain stuff around tech. And we see both of them. So our overall winners in the last few years, um, uh, last year's uh, winner, a lady called Rosemary Squire, is in the theatre business. So theatre has been around forever. Mm -hmm. Um, but they combine what you do in theatres with the skills of production, with the skills of ticketing and uh, use of social media to attract people to their uh, great productions, including, especially if people are watching this soon, Calendar Girls, which is on at Leeds at the moment, is one of theirs. <laughs> um, so they do that. And then if I go back a couple of years, an organisation called Market, led by a, a guy called Lance Ugler. Lance was working in the derivatives market in London, basically worked out that he could do it better than his current Lords and Masters, left, persuaded, this is leadership skill, persuaded some great guys to come with him, set this thing up, and they are now a competitor with big names like Reuters and Bloomberg doing the whole flow of data around that market better, faster, smarter. Oh. Um, how, how is it being for you running this? Uh, what, what is your learning? What, 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 what is that for you in terms of...? We do run it partly. Mm -hmm. because in trying to advise, so obviously we're advising businesses and entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. So if you run uh, at wards like that and you get to talk to Rosemary and Lance and hundreds of other examples, mm -hmm. then a huge amount of knowledge comes out. So maybe on the leadership, given we were talking about leadership earlier, where you see um, early stage companies, say, you know, 20 people doing something great and innovative and getting on, the leadership style there it's very close to say, I don't know, the captain of a sports club or something like that. They're all kind of volunteers. They've probably taken a risk abandoning whatever their safe job was to do the ridiculous thing that is do a startup or work with an SME. And they all believe that whatever they're doing is, well, probably worthwhile, bigger than just the, can I get some cash? Mm -hmm. um, but they are right behind whoever the leader is, classically. Mm -hmm. Move it on to say two or 300 people and I'd say eight times out of ten, the leadership style, the way that you run that first team doesn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. And either the leader has changed his or her style and has become a sort of more mid-sized, you know, spreading a vision, doesn't absolutely know everybody in the organisation, less matey, more sort of communicating to the big audience. Yeah. So well, they've either changed their style or, frankly, they have been changed. So there are venture capitalists, by the way, who recognise this. Oh, okay. And they, as they invest, they will essentially say to the proud, proud entrepreneur who's leading this thing, mm -hmm. 
that you can take our money but before you sign you better know that we might change you in the next year <laughs> and that's uh, also i mean it's interesting i mean you also giving a lot into I mean, people appreciate that i mean uh, these awards also celebrate success and i think there's a lot of networking going on well, and, so, uh, some of the guys enter because they want to go back to the team mm -hmm. Probably more the team than the outside world, more than the customers or the event. They want to go back to the team and say, look, it's not just me that says, yeah. the, you know, our message is authentic. My leadership style, whoever I am, is working because an outside organisation with a nice big brand like the EY brand mm -hmm. thinks we're doing a good job. No, I think it's quite inspiring that, uh, Stuart. Thank you very much. I mean, for the last part now of yeah. the interview, we just would like to ask you to leave a message to our students, academics, to SMEs, companies. Uh, in, in terms of how they can grow their business, how can they develop their leadership or any, any advice that you give to them, please? Well, I think maybe I'll concentrate on the entrepreneurial thing. So I think first learn to be a great manager. Being a great manager, being a great implementer, if you haven't got those in the organization, the organization's dead. Mm -hmm. But don't lose sight of the fact that growing beyond management and into leadership means having vision, means lifting your eyes from time to time and basically go, we could do this better. And I think I can persuade guys to come with me because I can lead a better version of whatever we're doing. So I think that there is something I might leave as a thought for uh, the people watching the video. Okay, thank you very much, Stuart. Thank Pleasure, you for thank you. being with us. Thank you.